So what I'm able to do today in my talk is to give a, a general overview of the presentation that we see in FASD um, and talk about kind of the brain damage uh, that it involves. Then I'm going to talk a bit about assessing and diagnosing and sort of my part of that, which is the neuropsychological profile in FASD. Um, talking about the importance of diagnosis and a little bit on behaviour management, which we'll sort of go into in more detail in our future later on. So I'm sure you guys all kind of know the broad diagnostic terms, but um, FASD itself isn't a diagnosis, it's an umbrella term which it kind of encompasses the, the diagnosis underneath. Um, obviously the most significant diagnosis is full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome, when you will see associated physical and facial features as well as the neurocognitive effects. Partial fetal alcohol syndrome is it often can be less diagnosed. The most commonly diagnosed one is the is the one at the bottom, ARND. Um, and this is where there, there's generally an absence of physical and facial features for all of those associated neurocognitive features. And the thing with this diagnosis is, is although it's the most common, it's also the most commonly missed or misdiagnosed. And, and that's the most important message uh, about this one, really. Just running you by, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of kind of where, where there are physical facial features. The, these are some examples of, examples of the most sort of severe kind of physical facial features in terms of um, almost an absence of thoughts from a very thin upper lip and some of the other features as well. But I mean, the most important thing to say is this stuff isn't really that significant. The significant bit is the damage to the brain underneath, the, you know. And, you know, a small percentage of children with FASD will have the facial features, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. We know alcohol is a teratogen. We know it halts neuron development and disorganises neural crest migration in the developing fetus. And I'll show you some diagrams of that in a minute. It causes the facial features, but the timing effect of this is literally days. We know the face is formed in pregnancy in sort of week six, seven. So if, if a mother you know, drinks at that pit, a point perhaps where they don't even know they're pregnant, but then doesn't drink for the rest of the time. That child may still end up with some physical features associated with alcohol exposure. But on the other way around as well, you know, for, for mothers that perhaps are more binge drinking throughout the pregnancy, they can easily miss those periods of time. So a child doesn't necessarily have the facial features associated, but they're still going to have the neurocognitive damage. Um, and we see the same thing in mouse studies. I'll show you a diagram of that in a minute. Um, and obviously with the other things which you associate with alcohol exposure, which makes it the teratogen that it is. It's the growth problems, the behaviour problems, learning, which I'll talk about, um, and physical problems as well. This is um, a bit of a complicated example, but it demonstrates the slug and twist are actually protein involved with embryonic development. And what you can see, so from A and F are controlled, um, and then the rest are B to E are different um, percentages of alcohol exposure to, the, to these um, proteins. And what you can see is as the alcohol exposure increases, it completely blocks the um, process of neural crest development and migration. At first it becomes disorganised and by E and J it completely freezes migration. And so, I mean, this just gives you a demonstration of the damage that alcohol can do to kind of neural cells. This is another example. These are reconstructed mouse embryos at 14 days gestation. Um, and the figures B and then the brain structure D they were exposed to alcohol at day seven of gestation. And what you can see is the facial features have changed in, in the mouse reconstruction that has been exposed to alcohol. The, the face is smaller. Um, you can see the mouth is smaller. Um, and it sort of takes on what, a very similar kind of facial effect that you see in human exposure as well. And what you can see is that the, the brain development is also changed. And, the pink olfactory bulbs at the top in figure C are completely missing um, in figure D. 
So these are just more examples again of what alcohol exposure does in, in adult, um, animal studies. We know that alcohol delays myelination uh, in the brain as well, um, and the effect of delayed myelination is, is generally a decreased speed of neural processing, and this may be some of that kind of slow cognitive processing that you can see in FASD. So when we're looking at diagnosis, you know, there's several things we look at. And the reason for that is because FASD is a diagnosis of exclusion as well as inclusion. You know, you have to be asking yourself at all times, is there anything else that might also explain the difficulties that this child is having? Um, so you are looking at, obviously, more than minimum exposure to alcohol, impaired neurocognitive functioning, difficulties with self-regulation and adaptive functioning in everyday life. The onset needs to be there from childhood. Um, and as I said, not better explained by anything else. Um, and, you know, a systematic review found 298 conditions associated with prenatal alcohol exposure, and that's why it can be so confusing to, to just kind of pick apart what caused what, in a sense. And, it, it, you know, we know it's a dose-dependent relationship. We know high levels of alcohol mean a high risk of damage. We know low levels may cause lower risk. But the only no risk is if, if there's no alcohol. And, and the real difficulty, and particularly with things that have come out in the last couple of months on the news, is to define low levels of alcohol. You know, because when you've got these nice big IKEA glasses, well, that can fit in four or five units. You know, and, and if you're speaking to a, a mother in clinic who said, I've just had a couple of glasses of wine a week, well, that could potentially be 10 units. You know, you, defining low is the problem because low means something different. I'm sure you've all seen this on, on the internet before, but it just, it's, a, it's a good diagram to demonstrate that there's no safe period, there's no safe time to drink alcohol in pregnancy. It, it's not, oh, it's fine after the first three months, or oh, it's fine once the baby's developed and you know, you're near the end. It's not safe, full stop, across the board. There's other factors um, in the pregnancies of many children with FASD. Um, not all, but many children may also be being exposed to other things in the womb as well, with either other drugs, um, smoking as well, and they all have their consequences for children with FASD. Um, I mean, smoking alone, even if you remove alcohol, carries with it six times the risk of ADHD um, in a developing child. So if you add alcohol, you're, you're causing a huge increase in that risk again. So you always just get compound effects, uh, alcohol plus potentially smoking, plus possibly something else. And, and that's kind of what, you know, that's, that's the child that, that you have at the end. And the added factor, the, there's an added factor of neglect as well for many children with FASD, those who are looked after or come into care um, and then subsequently adopted. You know, many children may have had a neglectful early start before coming into care. You know, we know neglect is associated with difficulties of its own. So again, you're looking at that compound effect of all of these exposures and experiences um, in, in a child with FASD. FASD is an invisible but significant disability. You know, many children with FASD, they don't have the associated um, facial features. They can, they're more than often very verbal with a normal IQ, but they still have organic brain damage. Um, they can't process information normally. The frontal, the damaged frontal lobes mean that they have an executive functioning deficit, which I'll talk about in more detail. Um, and therefore, traditional behaviour management techniques aimed at neurotypical children rarely work. And you get many well-meaning professionals sending parents to be familiar triple P courses and all of that kind of thing. And they mean well, but what they don't realise is these techniques don't work. And you're, they're kind of sending you and the child up to fail from, from the outset. Just going quickly back to the variability in visible brain damage. So most MRI scans of children, young people with FASD will appear structurally completely normal. And MRI is therefore not a useful means of diagnosis at all. And you wouldn't send a child for an MRI when you're looking at whether they've got FASD or not. However, if, they, if you are going to find um, something on MRI, these are the most common things you tend to find. The difficulty is that it's very, very variable. 
you would commonly maybe see volume loss to the corpus callosum, which is the bundle of fibres that bind the two hemispheres together. You could possibly find some atrophy in the frontal parietal lobes <coughs> or volume loss, some volume loss to the uh, cuticampus and basophanglia, or over, overall kind of loss in brain size or volume. The most common really severe effects, which, which are rarer, uh, would be either a complete absence of the corpus callosum um, or um, schizencephaly or lysencephaly, which is essentially smooth brain where the gyrine sulci haven't formed and the brain is almost completely smooth. Uh, and the other thing you might see is um, disorder of the cerebellum. The thing about structural MRIs, it, you can't measure anything like white matter integrity, you can't measure the co regional connectivity of how the, bra the areas, brain regions can connect to each other. So it's not useful in that sense. It's useful at saying, oh yes, that's all there and present, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those areas are functioning normally. Um, so a normal MRI doesn't necessarily say a lot at all in, in a fair thing. These are just some examples of, of MRI scans in FSC. Figure A is a typically developing child, and then B, C, and D are ch all children with FSD. And I mean, the thing to note is the variability that it, of the brain structures. What you can see in figure B, for example, is that there's volume loss towards the back end of the corpus callosum. Um, you can see in figure D a very um, obvious um, abnormality in the cerebellum and, and reduction in the size uh, of the cerebellum there at the back. And then you can see you can see some kind of general volume loss um, in some of the brain structures as well. So my bit, it, you know, it, in terms of the diagnosis of FASD is what, what tends to happen is that um, a community paediatrician will have done the history with, with a um, parent and child and there would be strongly suspected or known alcohol exposure in pregnancy. Um, and those children would be referred into the psychology service for um, neuropsychological assessment to ascertain whether their neuropsychological profile is in keeping or consistent with what we tend to see um, in alcohol exposure. And what we tend to see if we're looking at a textbook typical case is, is here. So generally speaking, verbal ability is lower than non-verbal ability. Um, we know that expressive language is generally a lot higher, however, than receptive language. So what um, people with FOC can say is often a lot more than what possibly is understood underneath that. Um, IQ can be normal or there can be general learning disability. Most commonly in full bloke fetal alcohol syndrome, IQ is in the 70s, um, and most commonly in kind of ARND, um, IQs are generally in the 80s, which is the low average. An IQ of 70 would indicate a mild learning disability. And we know executive functioning is always impaired. Do, do you all kind of understand what I mean by executive functioning, or do you want me to go into that? Okay, so if you imagine the brain to be like a computer system, the frontal lobes where executive functioning is housed is almost like the hard drive of that computer system. So even if you've got all your programs in place and everything all there and present, if the hard drive of the computer is not working, then it can't run those programs efficiently. So even if your IQ is normal, if this bit's not working efficiently, it can't run that IQ efficiently. So I always split executive functioning into hot and cold processes. So it, it's, executive functioning is essentially a a skill set. So the cold processes are all those kind of academic things like working memory, sustained attention, the ability to switch attention from one thing to the other, planning, organisation, all of those kind of things. And then hot effective functioning is more of the social side. So think difficulties such as social immaturity, social naivety, um, the hyperactivity, um, being sort of out of step with peers, all the friendship problems, all of those kind of things are kind of like hot executive functioning problems. So what you tend to see in children and young people with FASD is many will have difficulties in both camps. But some children and young people might have problems, more problems in one area than the other. 
Um, we all yeah, work in memory as part of the executive function system as our attention problems. And for the, the reason why many, many young people with FSD end up with a diagnosis of, a, of ADHD is because ADHD is in and of itself a disorder of the executive functioning system. Um, all the hyperactivity, the impulsivity, inattention, all of that stuff is part of that skill set. So you can see, if you think of that computer system, if, even if your IQ is 100, if you can't sustain attention, if you can't sort of, you know, sit still in the classroom, if you're forgetting what's being said to you, all of this stuff, because your executive functioning is impaired, you're going to really struggle to function at that IQ of 100 level, no matter what. And, and that's, that's what can be really confusing for teachers um, in, in school. This is a, just a, an example, it's not complete to scale, but a, a executive functioning is on a developmental trajectory. So if you think of your average two-year-old, so you've got age from the bottom here, and kind of level of executive functioning here. If you think of your average two-year-old, they don't have a lot of executive functioning skills at that point, which is why their attention is quite poor, you know, you can't really reason with them, you're running around trying to stop them running into roads and this kind of thing. But, you know, that's your average to your anyway. And you, you know, around that time, a young person, and this is often around the time sort of one or two that many children, of course, are adopted, there's not always a massive difference between children with FSD and children without FSD at this point. And this is the point where many people adopt children without knowing what may happen in the future. The point at which that gap and the differences become more noticeable is around that sort of six to eight year old period. And that's the point at which these frontal lobes of a typically developing child start to really sort of come into their own and they start to mature and you can reason with them more and they can sustain attention more you know, all of these things, and they become a lot more independent, whereas a young person with FASD is not going to be developing those skills at, at that rate. So that's where that gap starts to really widen, and that's where the diagnosis tends to come into play around those sort of ages. Um, and what happens, obviously, over time is in, in young know, people with FASD, the executive function will develop, but it won't ever develop to the same level um, as a young person. Who hasn't been exposed to alcohol. Please ask any questions about any of these slides, by the way, if there's something that doesn't make sense. So, if executive functioning disorder isn't recognised and understood in school, a child is often incorrectly labelled as one of these lazy, unmotivated, disorganised, naughty, poorly parented, all of these things because it's not understood. Um, problems with executive functioning in parents do begin in the first couple of years. This is when it becomes more obvious that a child with FASD is more easily influenced by others. They struggle with understanding cause and effect um, and predicting consequences. They struggle to learn from past mistakes. They often appear capable but with less ability underneath this. And this can be confusing and frustrating for teachers and can mean that their, you know, their sort of expectations of the child may be too high. Um, difficulty separating facts and fiction. Um, temper tantrums, these difficulties sort of with self-regulation and poor understanding of social rules. So this is when you start to see these difficulties, these sort of gaps between children with FSD and their peers at around the sort of six, seven, eight kind of mark. Even with a normal IQ, as I've said, children with FSD lack often lack the core skills that are needed to be able to succeed in the classroom. So that's that sitting still, listening sustaining attention, understanding cause and effect, following complex verbal instructions because of the receptive language problems, the executive function problems, the working memory problems, difficulty planning, difficulty with organising, time, belongings, and all of those kind of things. And many times you'll hear a teacher say, if he just tried hard, he'd be fine, he could do it. And that's not the case with people with FSD are generally trying to the point of absorption. And the difficulty is they're constantly hyper aroused. You know, you, you imagine in the classroom, if you're sitting there and you're forgetting what's being said to you a lot of the time, you're not understanding half of the other stuff, you're really struggling with sustained attention, then you're being expected to sit and do some kind of project where, because of your difficulties with planning and initiation of following, you're not really able to do that. 
then because of your sensory issues, the loudness of the classroom is overwhelming as well. You can imagine why one further thing, and you know, a child with FOC will snap and will have a meltdown in the classroom. And then it's that vicious cycle without the understanding of, you know, sort of being labelled that naughty child and, you know, and that's where having the diagnosis, having that understanding is so important so that we can kind of stop this vicious cycle. In terms of social functioning impairment, and I've put this in because um, many children I see in the community who do have end up with a diagnosis of FOC have often gone down a route to people asking whether they've got autism first. Um, and that could be because, because children with FOC do have difficulties with social functioning, but it's different to that of autism. So often, you know, children with FOC will have normal facial expressions, their eye content will be fine, their non-verbal communication will be fine. They still struggle with some of these difficulties um, that make them very, very socially vulnerable and socially naive. And that's why it's often misdiagnosed as atypical autism because they don't tick all the boxes, but they tick some of them. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the autism bit in a minute. I'm sure you've all seen this diagram, have you? I, I, I like this diagram because it, it gives a really good representation of, you know, how things are, you know, for, for young people with FASD. So, yes, they may have really well-developed expressive language. But, and, and often, you know, this, this could be a young person leaving care and being expected to go and live independently. Um, but while their expressive language might make it sound like they're perfectly capable of this, they've got money and time concepts of an eight-year-old, living skills of an 11-year-old, social skills of a seven-year-old, emotional maturity of a six-year-old. You know, why would you put a child that young and, and expect them to live independently? But without the understanding of FASD and that kind of spiky neurocognitive profile, you wouldn't understand this. And then in social care, wonder why these young people are you know, getting into trouble, falling into the wrong crowds, ending up, you know, in, in all sorts of difficulties because of that not understanding. FASD is a great mimicker of, of lots of other diagnoses and many young people of FASD can pick up all sorts of diagnoses along the way and attempt to explain the difficulties that they have. Uh, just on a slide on kind of autism spectrum disorder versus pure FASD, if you like, just to kind of sort of compare the two. So, as I said, you know, in ASD you often have abnormal eye contact, which you don't have with FASD. You often have limited facial expression and limited facial processing in ASD. In FASD, there's normal facial expression, although the processing of emotions and others can be a difficulty. In ASD, there's generally a disinterest in in peers, whereas with FASD there's a normal interest in peers, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's not difficulties in peer relationships. The executive functioning deficit you see in ASD is generally milder than what you see in FASD. Yeah, I think you know that, that's fine. Then, you know, with ASD, there could be difficulty initiating social interaction and also poor quality of interaction. Whereas with it, children with FSD, they're often extremely pro-social. They want, they want to be sociable. They make those initiations, but the quality may not always be ideal. Um, they can often be labelled too much, not knowing when to stop, those kind of things. And those can be the difficulty with that sort of disinhibited um, kind of presentation. Sharing affect means essentially sort of sharing emotions. So if you're having a joke, you're both laughing together. Or if you see something sad, you're sharing that kind of sadness. And that's often impaired with ASD, but it's not impaired with FASD. Um, and as we've said, non-verbal communication is generally um, more impaired with ASD, but not so much, not, not in FASD. So those are some of the, some of the comparisons that um, you can use to kind of separate the two. That's not to say that, you know, some children with FASD will also have autism. But what we want to separate out is who are the children with you know, FASD that have been wrongly diagnosed with atypical autism. Another association is um, ADHD, as we've said. 74% of children with FASD have been found to meet the criteria for an ADHD diagnosis. Um, as we said, ADHD is in, in itself a disorder. 
And I think the important thing to realise is that ADHD is not a separate diagnosis. It's a secondary diagnosis to FASD. The ADHD has been caused by alcohol exposure. And that's where the understanding has to, has to be in that sense. Um, you know, it's in, we know that there's a good evidence base for um, many children with FASD associated ADHD can have um, medical treatment for this, which can really help them in terms of managing in the classroom. If you can take away some of that hyperactivity and help with the inattention, then children are better prepared to be able to sort of learn. Um, but you, this has got to be in conjunction with behaviour management strategies and, and other such things as well. So we know that diagnosis changes prognosis for young people with FASD. Um, some of the most important bits that change prognosis is having an accurate diagnosis by age 8 or roughly around there. Having had a stable and nurturing home for at least 72% of their life. Stability particularly between ages of 8 and 12 when those kind of educational difficulties are really kicking in and becoming obvious. Um, being able to receive because of that understanding through the diagnosis, you know, special educational needs services and that kind of thing. And we, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. we also know, obviously, that prognosis is inversely related to the number of placement moves for those children in care, as, as is for all children, FASD or not. Other predictors of best prognosis, this paper done last year, has suggested that best prognosis is for those children with FASD who were born at term, being female seems to carry a better prognosis for some reason or another. Fewer dysmorphic facial features, higher IQ, less aversive life events in childhood, and parental warmth and fewer siblings. So now we just come on to behaviour management. I just realised we've only got five minutes, so I'm going to talk very fast the next few times. Um, as I said, children with FSD often don't respond like a typically developing child. Um, and the parent of the child with FSD at some point is like trying to navigate around London with a massive journey. The typical traditional behaviour management techniques to work, a child needs, you know, all of these ones that the Triple P program suggests, a child needs to have an understanding of future earning or deferred gratification. They need to have some degree of impulse control. They need to be able to understand cause and effect, have some understanding of their impact on others, have some concept of time, have to be able to regulate their emotional responses. And a typical child with FASD doesn't have these skills. So the following often are rarely successful for that reason. One of the key things to managing behaviour problems in FASD is about prevention. And although that sounds easier said than done, you know. Many children with FASD are easily overwhelmed by their environment. They have sensory integration difficulties. And a lot of the meltdowns I think you see in FASD are caused by environmental and external triggers. So pre-planning, although it's hard work, and analysing triggers and that kind of thing, it is the key to trying to minimise um, these difficulties. Preparation, such as um, photographs of people's places to prepare a child for upcoming events, Maintaining a routine, reassuring, and repetition are key for, for learning and managing these kind of things with children with FASD. In terms of meltdowns, reducing sensory overload is one of the key important factors. Um, children with FASD often have difficulty filtering and screening out background interference. Um, it, it's about helping them to learn self soothing techniques, it's about factoring in explosion times during and after school, really, really important. Building in movement breaks at school is really important. Doing little distraction breaks in the classroom can be really helpful. And these can be masked by the teacher sort of saying, oh, can you just go over and sharpen ten pencils for me? Or can you just take that to the office? You know, So that doesn't make a child feel different, but it enables them to just get up, have a few, you know, have a few moments for a break, and then come back again. And those kind of things are vital for children with FASD. Other things are too many choices can be a difficulty, particularly for younger children with FASD. You know, to make a choice, you've got to be able to hold two things in mind at once, um, which is tricky as it is if you've got a, a working memory that's impaired. Then you've got to, you know, make a choice out of those two things. So it's better to make give closed or limited choices. Even better with, with little ones is to hold up two physical things for them to choose. So you're taking out that kind of the, the working memory loading from the choices. Pr 
transition for another difficulty as well. Um, children with FSD can become stuck on one activity and struggle to move on to another. That kind of stuckness is part of an executive functioning deficit. And it's something that we assess um, when we're looking at the neuropsychological profile of children with FASD, where they can be doing something or problem solving, and this can be really common in the classroom. But even though they know what they're doing isn't working, they struggle to move on and do something else. So they become very, very repetitive and need somebody else to support them to move their thinking on. Um, visual schedules could be helpful in the classroom. Sand timers for things like screen time, bath times, and that kind of thing. A lot of things that you would use for autism are helpful for children with FASD as well. The other thing I get asked a lot of is sort of using time out. And the thing with time out is it doesn't help children with FASD to self-regulate. Sometimes it can even make things worse because, because of that struggling to calm themselves down. So we always suggest, you know, helping them to build a nice, calm, cozy place. And this is good to do at school as well. Um, helping them to build like a little cave that, that they can sort of have some ownership over. And helping them to then recognise when they're starting to become dysregulated, when they're starting to struggle, that they can be guided to go to that place to, to be able to calm down and get back in touch with sort of what's going on and that kind of thing. And so this shouldn't be used as a punishment as such. It should be more used as a, a way to help children to learn when to, to recognise when things are becoming tricky and to be able to take themselves out of the situation and have support to do that. No matter how, I say this as a parent of three boys myself, it doesn't always work, but no matter how frustrating the situation is, shouting and losing the clock doesn't actually help. Um, and as, as parents and as teachers, you know, we, we always say we need to be bigger, stronger, calmer and containing, even when we don't feel like that. I don't know if anybody's seen the Circle of Security stuff. There's a website, if you Google Circle of Security, um, and although this one is about younger children, I think it's a really nice thing as parents just to remind ourselves of that we're a child's secure base, FASD or no FASD. We need to sort of support, support them going out into the world, but also always being bigger, and stronger, wiser and kind, and taking charge when we need to, whatever that means. Um, and organising feelings, as it says there, even though that sort of depicts a younger child, is a really important thing for children. But I definitely have a look at this stuff because it's got lots of information on this website. When prevention didn't work and a meltdown is happening, you know, we, what we suggest is to, to get down near your child if you can. Calmly and firmly labelling the emotion can be helpful. Saying something like it looks like you are feeling is, is really good. Rather than telling them that that's what they're feeling, you're, just, you're suggesting that that's what it looks like. The next bit is a lot of guesswork. What can help some children doesn't help others. So whether that's firm touch, whether that's light touch, whether that's no contact and just being there. It's about being calm, being with them, whatever that may be, and then when the child is calm, then distracting. You know, it's, it's worth remembering that learning from past mistakes is a challenge for children with FASD. So that kind of get going at them then isn't, isn't going to change anything. It's more about helping them to recognise over time when these meltdowns are going to happen and, and being able to steer off of it rather than punishing it after that. So it's about reinforcing positive behaviour through repetition, through praise, and then managing the meltdowns as best you can when they happen. Many children with FSD would say from talk to talk, they, which sometimes being so verbally able can mark the difficulties underneath. And this can be really difficult in school. Um, you know, particularly when a child appears very able because they're telling their teacher, oh, I can do that, that's fine, no, it's fine, it's all good. But actually, you know, and often if during a uh, neuropsych assessment, many children, if, if you're setting up a problem solving task to see how they manage it, they will tell you exactly what they're going to do, which sounds absolutely fine. But when it comes to actually doing it, it all falls apart. And that is the executive functioning deficit, because they can say it, but they can't actually often follow that through, plan out, sequence a plan of action, and, and then see that through to the end. And if school teachers can't understand that, they, I think they often feel that if, if you 
you're saying you can do it, why aren't you then doing it? You know, and, and I think that's a really important bit to, to sort of round home when you're teaching a child with FASD. That just because they say they can do it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be able to follow that through. And you know, what's often reported is well following instruction. It's more than likely to be calm following instruction for all for all of those for all of those difficulties on there. I'm speeding up. I've just got a few more slides. Just the strategies, not solutions document. Um, I've a few many of you have seen this. It's on the it's on the notes on the website. That's a really good one to give to your child's school. Um, this this is just a snapshot of some you know some of the um, strategies on there. But it's a really big document, but it's worth giving to school with highlighted bits that are particularly relevant for your child. Just quickly, friendships and socialise. Children with FSD can struggle with maintaining friendships, and it's really important to try to support that by um, sustaining friendships with shared, shared interests, shared hobbies, rehearsing conversations, um, and just like a child with autism, continual rehearsal for new situations and what's going to happen, what might happen, and what they might, what's going to be expected of them is, is really important. The most important take home message is remember to halve your child's chronological age when you're pitching your expectations of them, particularly socially and emotionally. So if your child is eight, they're actually four in terms of their ability to respond emotionally and socially. Pitch your behaviour management strategies at that level, pitch how you're expecting them to react to things at that level, and that can reduce your frustration as well as theirs because your you know your expectations are at you know, are more realistic then. And most importantly, in terms of their social vulnerability, if you do that half in the age, if you wouldn't expect your four-year-old to go walk to the shop, you know, don't expect your eight-year-old to do it. Um, and that's so important, that need for more supervision, both at home but also at school, particularly at break times, lunch times, that kind of thing. So finally, as parents, as carers, as parents, as teachers, children with FSE, it's important, you need to be their external brain, you need to be their frontal lobes in that sense. If you provide that support system, that scaffolding, then, then they can fulfil their potential around that. They may not always, you know, they may not always understand the link between consequences of behaviour, um, even if they appear to, and repetition is key to a child with FSE learning. Um, supervision, as we said, and accepting that some skills may always be a difficulty for them. Final slide. Lot, I get asked about the future a lot for children with FSD, and you can't make any guarantees. FSD is a spectrum, as you know, much like ASD. Um, some, you know, more, more severe cases of children with FAS may not be able to live independently because they're too socially vulnerable, because of the difficulty they have to be sexually functioning um, and general learning disability. And many others can live independently or what we might call interdependently, where they you know they can live independently to some extent but may need a bit of support with money management, all of those kind of things that require high levels of executive functioning to make sure that you know that they're, they're managing those kind of things okay. So um, and and the important thing again is about having having that if they need it, with having that diagnosis, having access to adult services is, is required. I'm going to stop now because I've over talked. I'm sorry. Okay, well, thank you very much, Cassie. That was really informative. And I know everybody. <laughs> We're just going to hear from Andy now, and then we'll have some questions uh, before we have the coffee break. But I love that the last slide is pointing to the future. And that leads in perfectly to uh, Andy's comments, because as we mentioned before, Andy's an adult with FASD who has been doing amazing things already. He's a young adult, uh, but he's already been to Uganda, he's going to Finland, he's, he's doing amazingly. So we thought it would be really useful to hear Andy's perspective, and you can talk about that or, or whatever you want people to try to understand about um, what it's like to be living with FASD. And, um, I imagine listening to some of the cold clinical stuff isn't always easy, but at the end of the day, that's background for the very real lives that we all 
leading. So thank you, Mindy, for joining us as well. So I would thank my at the age of 12, which was quite hard to come to the reality that I have to it because I had gone so long without knowing I had FASD. It has been hard for me in day to day life with FASD for simple. For example, remembering to do simple tasks so that I just like cleaning my teeth and general day to day tasks. But I have not let it stop me doing my passion, which is sports coaching. I'm going to board to coach Uganda, to Uganda to coach underprivileged children, which was an incredible experience. I'm also currently doing a sports coaching in primary schools in Midway, which does include special needs sessions working with their agility bank coordination. My next adventure is on the 6th of November going to Finland to put Christmas activities on for children in the local area of Kokola. Thank you for listening.